Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for signing on tonight. I, I am very thankful um, to join you tonight to talk about all of your children's uh, stomach issues and nutrition questions. So thank you for asking me to speak tonight. Um, feel free to type any um, questions into the chat box and I will do my best to answer them all at the end. Um, so I will get started. Um, I have no conflicts of interest um, in particular to any brands or products that I will be discussing tonight. Um, so I just want to introduce um, a little bit of the GI tract to you. So this is a huge area spanning anywhere from the upper esophagus where your child is swallowing down into the stomach itself, um, which travels all the way through 20 feet of small intestine and then through the colon. And then we have these um, sort of extra uh, luminal, we call them organs, uh, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, everything that helps us um, sort of break down our nutrients and detoxify our uh, nutrients and our medications um, and digest these foods. So there's so many different um, organs that come into play and so many different things that could be happening when your child says, I have belly pain or my tummy hurts. Um, as you can see here, there's many uh, things going on in that very small area in your child. So it is important when you see just a child who looks like this, um, really to see your doctor and sort of give them the full story because um, you know we often need to um, evaluate them and see sort of what the situation is. So these are um, sort of the common complaints that I get um, so most frequently, um, stomach pains, nausea, vomiting, painful or difficulty swallowing, diarrhea, constipation, fecal soiling. Um, I will talk a little bit about all of these um, and then we'll sort of talk about the general nutrition um, tips and tricks that I like to give. I could talk about any one of these for an hour, which I will not do tonight, but um, I will do my best to summarize for all of you. So the most common causes of abdominal pain, I would say um, in children anywhere from a year to 18 years of age and more, um, I like to categorize um, sort of the causes um, into chronic, meaning let's say months to years versus um, acute pain. So acute is sudden onset and short lasting. And the number one here, as you can see here, cause of belly pain in kids is typically constipation. So you might see your pediatrician, they'll feel your child's belly, um, often they'll, recommend Miralax and whatnot, but there's obviously a million other reasons that your child can have stomach pains. I put constipation as number two also, because that's really um, probably still up there in the most common reasons. And then for chronic, um, there's, you know, 10, 20 other things that I can list here, but um, sort of just to summarize, um, irritable bowel syndrome, or what we call functional pain in the younger children, um, different infections and irritations in the stomach called gastritis, um, different ways food can affect your children. Um, so a food intolerance or uh, lactose intolerance, things of that sort, autoimmune disorders like celiac disease and inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, versus let's contrast this with the acute onset abdominal pain. So does your child wake up in the middle of the night crying in pain? Um, and this can span anywhere from gas pain to constipation to a real sort of serious issue like appendicitis or uh, pancreatitis or kidney stones. So um, in any of these situations, obviously you don't need to uh, be the one sort of figuring this out, but sort of knowing is this something um, sort of severe or not? And when should I see my pediatrician? When should I see a specialist? So when do you see your doctor? Um, so for your child who's complaining of pain, um, number one, the question is how bad is this pain? Are they just, you know, kind of mildly uncomfortable? They're curled up on the couch eating a snack or are they really crying and you have to pick them up from school or they're waking up from sleep with this pain? Obviously severe pain is um, something concerning to us. Um, 
localized pain. So this is how we um, in medicine think of the belly. So we split it into four quadrants um, and this correlates with the child's um, quadrant. So their left and their right side. And in the right upper quadrant um, is where the gallbladder and the liver um, tend to hide. And in the right lower is where the appendix is. Sometimes the appendix, um, if there's inflammation, can start as pain just in the middle um, and then go down into the right lower quadrant. Um, the left upper quadrant is pretty nonspecific. The left lower quadrant um, is usually just stool, but obviously if you're getting down into the very lower area, sort of towards the pelvis, there's plenty of other things, um, you know, like ovary, ovaries and ovarian cysts and whatnot, other things that can be bothersome. Um, anytime there's other what we call red flag symptoms associated with pain, um, such as weight loss or vomiting or fever, um, those would all be um, concerning things that, you know, I would say might make this something that you should see your doctor a little bit sooner. So we'll talk about vomiting a little bit. And again, it completely depends on if this is acute or if it's chronic, because there are probably 30 different uh, things that can cause vomiting in a child. So for the acute vomiting situation, um, anywhere from you know the common virus or food poisoning, um, children who have anxiety or car sickness, um, and then kind of the more hospital oriented things like intestinal blockages or gallbladder issues, things like that. Um, contrasting this with chronic uh, reasons for vomiting, um, gastritis, um, reflux, certain conditions in the esophagus, something called the eosinophilic esophagitis, um, migraines or cyclic vomiting, which is kind of on the spectrum of migraines, um, and also anxiety can make kids vomit. So it's important to think, is this kind of going on for a long time? How often are they vomiting? Um, and again, you don't need to be the one figuring out sort of uh, what uh, diagnosis it is, but these are kind of the things that we see most frequently. So when do you actually call about vomit? So I get a lot of questions about vomit color and I will try to keep this not gross for all the non-medical people here. Um, but I always hear the vomit looks like bile or it's only bile coming up. And to me, bile is truly a dark green like you see in this picture here. Um, so anything kind of yellow or mucus colored or white or clear, um, that would be normal. But when it's truly bile, that dark green, that indicates to me that there may be some sort of a blockage um, somewhere in the intestine. Um, obviously, if there's bright red blood, um, please see a physician. Um, it's sometimes hard to tell if, um, if it's blood or if it's um, you know, the red food dye that your child might have eaten. But if you're not sure, obviously you call your doctor. And then the bottom picture here, um, again, I spared you what a real picture would look like, but we call brown vomit, um, coffee ground emesis. So blood that has been digested in stomach acid um, turns to this kind of grainy uh, coffee ground looking appearance. So that can indicate that there may be some source of bleeding. So obviously, if any of these bile colors or blood or digested blood colors come up, or if it's associated with pain or they're um, nonstop vomiting, or if they're not able to drink enough fluids to stay hydrated, those would all be reasons um, that you might need to think about coming even to the emergency room. So how do you treat vomiting? So the number one most important thing for me is always uh, making sure your child is able to be hydrated. So you can go days on end without eating solid food. I don't recommend that, but um, hydration, I mean, you can really get severely dehydrated within two to three days. So um, always pushing the fluids. And I, I really say at that point when your kid is really sick and it was a stomach bug or you know vomiting for whatever reason, um, whatever they're willing to drink is, is perfectly fine. So Pedialyte pops or other ice pops, um, juice, even though I don't usually recommend juice, kind of whatever it takes to keep them hydrated and out of the emergency room is um, totally fine. Um, looking in the babies for um, wet diapers as a sign of hydration. So usually we say, 
um, at least three wet diapers for the day for a 24 hour period. So um, something just to keep your eye on. For the older kids who, um, who feel very nauseated and are um, vomiting several times in a row, um, you can practice this slow diaphragmatic breathing with them. So just having them take these big deep breaths can help slow that vomiting process. Um, and then of course there's prescription medications. Um, so whether it's um, you know, outpatient prescribed by your doctor or by a specialist or from the emergency room, um, there are options um, that work very well. So I wanna talk about reflux and uh, reflux sort of contrasted to vomiting uh, because I always hear that my baby is vomiting all the time and that's of course very worrisome, but reflux in itself is very different and reflux among infants is very different than reflux in older children and adults. So infants, um, all will reflux. I mean, they have very um, loose muscles at the bottom of their esophagus and they're on a liquid diet and they're rolling around and they're on their bellies or you know on their backs or whatnot. So every time they burp or move, you can imagine that if you were on a liquid diet, all that milk is gonna come up. So when it dribbles out, that's you know reflux or you know regurgitation. Um, but vomiting is um, forceful. So vomiting is more projectile. So that in an infant, if that's something frequent or if they're not gaining weight because of the reflux or the vomiting, those would all be concerning signs. Um, for most infants, they do not require um, reflux medications. Um, so sometimes pediatricians will um, prescribe those. Often they'll refer to us. Uh, but, you know, it's important to know sort of the whole story. Are they just sort of these happy babies who are spitting up frequently and don't seem bothered by it? Or is it really affecting their feeding and their weight? So that's often, you know, a referral that we'll uh, see babies for. Um, babies who are vomiting or older children who are vomiting, obviously that's, you know, very different. Um, so please um, keep in mind the difference between the just spitting up and regurgitation versus um, truly vomiting. Bowel movements, um, very exciting. I could talk about this all day, so, and I do. So um, bowel movements, just to sort of tell you, everyone always asks me, what should my bowel movements look like? Or what should the kids, you know, how often should they be pooping? My kid hasn't pooped in a week. Um, I like to say that your child should be having, this is for the toddler and older age, anywhere from one to three formed soft bowel movements per day. Um, there should be no straining, there should be no blood. Um, in the infants, they can range anywhere from pooping every single time they feed, which is 12 times a day, to once every two weeks for some breastfed babies. Um, so it totally depends for the infants on kind of what they're eating, as long as the poops are soft and they're gaining weight for the infants under one. Um, it may not matter how often they're going, um, but for the older kids, it really should be a formed, soft, non-painful bowel movement every day. Anything outside of that range, um, or at least you know, more frequently out of that range, I would say is abnormal. For diarrhea, um, this would be um, defined as you know any loose or liquidy bowel movement with increased frequency, and constipation, which many children are, and we don't even realize it uh, until you see us, is um, having painful or hard bowel movements, having huge, huge bowel movements. Like parents will say, I can't believe this came out of my child, or it's a soda can shaped poop, or they're clogging the toilet and they're like a two-year-old, um, having infrequent bowel movements. So having two per week or having um, some form of fecal incontinence. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit, but that's for kids who are withholding and then leaking around it. Um, so that is how I would define constipation. So this you might have seen um, sometimes with your pediatrician, or if you've taken your child to see me, this is um, sort of this uh, stool form scale that we use uh, really because it's hard to get kids to describe their bowel movements, whether they're three or 18, they all seem very embarrassed by it. So I would say the most picture perfect bowel movement would be the type four, which is nice and soft and smooth like a banana. 
Um, type three and type five, I'm also willing to accept anything outside of that range is leaning towards, um, you know, the harder, drier stools in the type one and two, or the looser diarrhea kind of stools in six and seven. Um, for younger kids, toddlers, babies, obviously, you know, we do tend to see much looser, softer stools, which can be a variant of normal. So I would say this is for kind of the older, um, the older school age and up group. So I get lots of questions about what color should the poop be? Um, and I also thought I would spare you the picture of real poops um, and show you a very nice picture of a sunflower, which I realized has all of the colors of normal bowel movement. So anything that is brown or green or yellow is all fine and normal. Um, green can indicate that, you know, things might be just moving a little bit faster through the intestinal tract. Um, and yellow, you know, in babies, especially breastfed babies is very normal. Um, I get a lot of questions about, and pictures about um, fluorescent, weird colored poops, neon green, neon blue. Those are all colors that do not naturally occur in the human body. And I can almost promise you that your child ate either a cupcake or a donut or some sort of medicine that had some food dye in it. Um, so that'll be the first thing that someone will ask you if you're seeing one of these funky colors. But the colors that I don't like to see um, and indicating that something is abnormal that needs further evaluation is white stools. Um, and white, I would include anything on the tan beige spectrum. So mostly in infants, um, but that can indicate some sort of a liver or a bile blockage. Um, bright red, which we'll talk about, um, sometimes it's blood, sometimes it's not. Many things can mimic blood, but I will show you um, some things that can mimic blood. And then black um, can indicate um, digested blood from an intestinal bleed, uh, but you can also get black um, from certain medications such as Pepto-Bismol. So these are the most common things I would say that mimic blood in the stools if your child's eaten a ton of cherries, if you've had beets, um, very bright red, you can see, almost purple, um, and then any sort of artificial food dyes, jello, um, icing, anything in a, a medication, the red dye number 40, whatever, um, and then the Pepto is really the one that can make it black. Um, diarrhea. Um, this is a huge topic. So I will just say that if this picture resonates with you, you might wanna bring your child to see a specialist. So of course, everyone gets diarrhea on occasion and there might be um, something that might've set it off that day, whether you were nervous or whether your child ate something that didn't agree with them, but there are a million and one reasons um, why children get diarrhea. So it really needs to be taken sort of in the context of how they're doing otherwise. Are there any other concerning symptoms? Is there something relevant in the family history? Um, so anywhere from um, anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease, thyroid problems, infections, Crohn's disease, um, there, there's a huge array of reasons why children can have loose and watery bowel movements. Um, so we have different ways of testing, of course, um, to see sort of what is causing this, um, this abnormal stool. Um, and hopefully we can figure it out and give your child something um, to make them feel better. But it is a huge topic in itself. If there's any questions specifically about diarrhea, I'm happy to answer at the end. Um, steatorrhea. So this is something that we see less frequently, but um, sort of interesting. And I get it from time to time. It looks like my kid has oil drops in the toilet or floating around the poops. It looks very greasy, very oily. Um, this can be seen, number one, if your child is taking a tremendous amount of oil or oil supplements um, in any sort of um, fat malabsorption disorder. Um, so things like celiac disease or pancreas issues. Um, if you eat a tremendous amount of nuts or cashews, you can even have steatorrhea. So I just wanted you to be familiar with oil blobs in the toilet not being necessarily a normal poop. Um, constipation sort of on the other end. So the most important um, things that I tell parents of children who are very constipated is kind of the basics, fluids, fiber, 
Miralax is one of the easy stool softeners. Um, there's plenty of other more aggressive uh, ways to make your child poop. Um, but kind of the more natural things, um, behavioral modifications, there's lots of tricks that we can do to help your child sort of get more comfortable uh, with the toilet if they're um, sort of in the early toilet training stages versus if they're just kind of not taking the time to sit and poop because they're busy playing with their friends. Um, so this is showing you a nice depiction of how I love to tell people how to poop. So I want all your children to have their feet reach the floor at minimum. So a lot of younger kids will have their feet dangle um, and their feet don't reach the toilet once they uh, don't reach the floor once they're standing on the toilet. Um, but if you can see here, the guy on the right who's squatting, he actually has opened the angle in the pelvis to make it much easier to poop. So the squatty potty and all these toilet kind of step stool products, um, they have a scientific backing. So there's studies that show that the time to poop and the effort of pooping is much quicker and easier when you're in the squatting position. Um, so I always say, especially for, you know, kids um, who are shorter than adults or even the adults to get a step stool because it does make it easier. And this is why in certain um, Asian countries and African countries, um, they do have these um, squatting toilets where you are standing and squatting over these toilets. And I think they are all, um, for the better for it in terms of their bowel health. So please, um, think about getting a step stool for your child if they're struggling with constipation. This is something that I see, um, sort of in kids, I would say toilet training age to usually about 10 years old. Um, and it's called encopresis. Um, you may see staining of stool in your child's underwear. They may not feel it. Um, that's often an indication that this is encopresis. And basically why it happens is these are children who are chronically constipated, who are holding in their stools because they don't like the toilets at school. They don't wanna go at their friend's house. They don't wanna stop playing video games. So they hold and hold and hold it. And all the poop gets bigger and harder and everything else that they've eaten and drank and all the Miralax you're giving them leaks around these harder poops. And the rectum actually gets very dilated um, and it gets very um, desensitized in the nerves. So it takes very aggressive behavioral diet and medication changes. Um, and really, I mean, this can go on for months to years and it can be very stressful, obviously to parents and to kids and embarrassing. So that's why I really like to see these kids early on. If you sense that they're, um, sort of heading towards stool holding, um, I like to kind of intervene more aggressively from the beginning, just because it seems to spiral a little bit deeper, the longer you wait. Um, so again, that's definitely um, something I see frequently. Growth and weight concerns. Um, so kind of on both ends of the spectrum, um, children who are not gaining enough weight, children who are overweight, um, which can affect you know, the liver. When, when a child's obese, you can have fatty liver disease. Um, and height concerns. So a lot of our nutrition contributes to the ability to grow in height. Um, so often pediatricians will send us a patient or the endocrinologist will send us a patient um, to figure out, is there a GI reason why they're not growing in height? Um, gluten, just very briefly, gluten is um, sort of another topic I just wanted to briefly touch upon, and it's always made out to be the bad guy. Um, gluten is delicious and what makes your bread nice and spongy and, and texturally yummy. Um, so gluten is the protein that is found in wheat, barley, and rye, and it's responsible for the immune response for celiac disease. So that it is possible to have a gluten sensitivity or gluten intolerance that is not celiac disease. 
Um, but in celiac disease, you really have the immune system damaging the intestine, whereas the other non-celiac uh, ones do not cause physical harm, they just cause symptoms. And some celiac patients have absolutely no symptoms. So sometimes they might come to us just because they're not growing. So if your child is eating a piece of bread and then gets a bellyache, it does not at all mean that they have uh, celiac disease. And being on gluten at the time of screening for that, um, at the time of blood work um, as the initial screen is very important. So please don't remove gluten from your child's diet until either your pediatrician or a gastroenterologist has screened for that if that's one of your concerns. Lactose, um, another sort of category um, that is often made to be the bad guy. <laughs> um, I just wanna to touch on lactose intolerance very quickly. Um, so true lactase deficiency, um, which is congenital, is very, very rare. That's when you're born without the enzyme to digest lactose, which is um, one of the, the sugars that is in, you know, the milk and dairy proteins. Um, lactate milk, a lot of people say, I mean, it's kind of a nonsense branding situation, but they say it's lactose free. It's actually not. Um, it's normal milk. There's lactose in it. All they're doing is adding, you can see in the ingredients, a lactase enzyme. So it is lactose normal containing milk. They are just mixing in the ingredient in lactate uh, pills, which is the enzyme. So if you think your child might be lactose intolerant and they respond well to either lactate milk or these kind of um, just enzyme products, that might be legitimate. There's obviously other ways that we can test for lactose intolerance. So we can do um, something called a breath test, which we can send you home with, or um, even at the time of upper endoscopy, we're able to screen for this, but doesn't always need to be that invasive. So I want to, in the next 15 minutes or so, switch over to um, kind of healthy eating and drinking and just practical tips um, for you and your children, because this is a lot of uh, what I see is, you know, counseling on sort of these picky eaters and kids who aren't gaining weight and kids who are gaining too much weight. So we'll talk about kind of the, the general um, ideas that I like to stick with and uh, we'll go from there. So beverages first I wanna talk about. Um, the number one most important thing that I like to stress to everyone is reducing your sweetened beverages for your children. Um, before the age of two, there should be absolutely no sweetened beverages. Milk does not count as a sweetened beverage. This means um, juice or iced tea or lemonade or whatnot. Um, and they actually recommend a maximum of one single cup per week for any older child. So I see kids drink three juice boxes a day or two Gatorades a day. It's a tremendous amount of sugar other than the calories. You know, obviously this is something that just crave, helps them crave these sweets and these sweet um, sort of foods and puts them into this um, higher risk category of, you know, being at risk for metabolic syndrome and pre-diabetes. So please work on beverages um, with your children. Um, it's really important. And we'll talk about some practical options. Um, cow's milk versus plant-based milk. There's many alternatives and options for the milk kids who like to, who like to drink their milk. Um, from one year to two years, usually, you know, whole milk is fine if they don't have an intolerance. Um, but for, you know, that age or older, um, plant-based milks are okay if they don't need the calories. So sometimes between ages one and two, um, things like oat milk or almond milk might not have enough calories. Um, but plant-based milks in general, um, I say, look for the unsweetened ones. And there are some good brands like Ripple for kids, um, which is pea protein based. That is pretty good and pretty close to mimicking what's in, um, the cow's milk. Um, water. So <laughs> water is, um, by far the, the most important thing that will help your child with being healthy, not overeating, um, avoiding dehydration, headaches, constipation. It's just a good habit to get in. And everyone who thinks their kids drink enough, they never do. So these are the general guidelines for the amount of uh, cups of water that I recommend per age. And usually the parents who think their kids drink a lot see this and are very surprised by how much water I say to drink. 
Um, so water, you know, you can include if they're having, let's say they're one cup of, um, of juice per week in this category, but I would say, please focus on your water um, as much as you're able. Um, these are the drinks that I like to live in. So soda, um, iced tea, that sweetened Gatorade in any form. So this uh, bottle of Coke, 20 ounce Coke has 16 teaspoons of sugar in it. So that's a tremendous, crazy amount of sugar. What looks like a healthy iced tea actually has nine teaspoons of added sugar. Gatorade, normal Gatorade, 8.5 teaspoons of sugar. And Gatorade Zero, how are they saying they have zero grams of sugar or zero teaspoons of sugar? Well, Gatorade Zero and all of these kind of non-nutritive sweeteners and artificially sweetened, zero, low calorie, whatever drinks, um, they tend to have these artificial non-nutritive sweeteners, meaning they have no calories um, and they seem to be one of these um, sort of um, sugars in them. So Splenda, um, sucralose is the one that I believe is in this Gatorade. Um, Splenda, sweet and low, all of these um, are not sort of freebies when it comes to zero calories. They still can affect um, your taste receptors, getting your child used to these sort of sweetened beverages. Um, it can affect what we call the microbiome. So it can affect the different bacteria that are living in the gut. So please, you know, look at these sort of artificial sugars um, as sort of a, a, an aside uh, to these real sugars. So these are some alternative things that I like to offer. Um, because a lot of children do not want to drink plain water. Um, so flavored water, um, things that have zero sweeteners added and it's just naturally flavored. Um, so something like hint water, flavored seltzers. So make sure again, there's not juice or um, sweetener in it, but there's a lot of seltzers that have no added sugars or juice in them. Um, plain iced tea, so unsweetened iced tea. Um, you know, you can squeeze your own lemon into it, um, but those are, you know, zero calorie, unsweetened, nice options. Um, fruit infusion bottles, kids love these, especially the younger ones. They're fun to make. You can squeeze an orange in it in the morning. You can float your fruits around and it makes it nice and yummy throughout the day. And then of course, for the kids who refuse to drink any of these, obviously they need to be hydrated. So if they're very juice focused, um, I say to water it down significantly and put a splash of juice in it. For the foods, um, everything in moderation. I, I don't set any um, huge boundaries and I never like to say that children, you know, need to lose weight or um, anything of that sort, but it, I think it's important to remember that even the, the sweets and the desserts, everything should be in some form of moderation, no adult or child eats a perfect diet. Um, in general, kind of what we think of as the Mediterranean diet, so more natural, um, unprocessed foods are what I like to um, say are kind of the healthiest for kids. So as much as you're able, limit processed foods, so things that come in boxes and prepackaged, you know, stuff at the supermarket, um, anything with artificial preservatives, um, and then sugars and processed sugars, which we will talk about. So sugars are very different. They come in all different forms. Um, table sugar is refined sugar. Um, you have the non-nutritive sweeteners, which are the ones that are zero calorie. Highly processed sugars, which are um, uh, corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup. Those are very chemically involved. Um, these are all three categories of sweeteners that I would say to limit as best as able. Um, these are the natural sugars. So obviously I don't recommend putting these things on everything, but um, honey, if your child's older than one year old, um, is a much more natural sweetener for let's say baking or for mixing into your oatmeal. Um, real maple syrup, those are all natural sugars and natural sugars occur, um, you know, naturally in fruits um, and in milk as lactose. So all sugars are not bad, of course, but I do want you to, to think about which ones your child is eating. So how do you get your kid to eat healthy? Um, I get a lot of questions about this. Um, I think eating your meals together helps tremendously. Um, so putting your phones down, no TV, 
um, really just sitting with your kids and talking about your day. I know that things get busy and it's hard to always do this, but um, the more you can do this, the more they see this as a nice, relaxed, um, sort of structured time to sit and eat. Portion control um, is really important. So, you know, if you're serving pasta um, or mac and cheese or whatnot, put something on the side. So don't just give a giant bowl of pasta, put, you know, a little vegetable on the side or even fruit if your kid's not gonna eat the vegetable. Um, always offer a safe food. So if you're serving salmon and you know your kid would never touch salmon, you know, maybe put something on the side that you know they would like, um, like sweet potatoes or some carrots, whatnot. So try to offer a safe food so that you're not having to cook them a hot dog every night, which I don't recommend because that feeds the habit of very picky eaters. Um, you can certainly um, encourage small pieces. I, I don't think you need to push it, but if you can, you know, put a small piece of something new on their plate each night, even if they're not interested, just offer it. And at some point you might be surprised. Um, changing up your utensils and your plates and the way you cut your food can be very exciting, especially to the younger kids. So um, trying to mix it up a bit and then playing it cool. So if you're pushing your kid to, eat um, you know, a piece of fish or something like broccoli or super healthy, they're gonna wanna not do it because you're pushing them to do it. So try to be relaxed around dinner, um, not forcing them to eat um, or threatening them in any way because that really just stresses them out and is going to make them not wanna do it. Um, try to make it fun. So let your kids participate in the food shopping and making the foods and making their snacks for the next day. So making it fun and trying these bento boxes and, you know, these uh, kebabs and cute shapes and whatnot. Obviously not everyone is a Pinterest mom, but as best you can try to make it fun because kids respond to that. And this is my now one-year-old who I certainly let make a mess. I think it's very important to let kids, you know, especially the younger ones, explore, make a mess, um, sort of just have fun and enjoy what they're eating. Um, try alternatives and mix-ins. So your child who will only eat noodles, um, I recommend trying lentil pasta or mixing a little bit of these lentil pastas, which are great fiber and protein into your other pastas. Um, adding some quinoa into your rice. So for the kids who are eating rice three times a week, obviously adding some nutrition would be a nice step and a small goal. Um, mixing vegetables into their rice. Um, if they're eating chips all day long, try black bean chips. The first ingredient is black beans. So it's a little bit better than normal chips. Um, chia seeds, I love chia seeds and I love ground flax seeds. So the two of these have tremendous nutrition. They have protein, they have vitamins, nutrients. They're also really great for kids who are super constipated. So they mix very well into some sort of pudding, oatmeal, yogurt, um, smoothies especially. These mix in very well and hide very well. So they're nutritious and you don't really taste it if you need to hide it from the younger kids. And then yogurt, I love yogurt as a snack, um, but there's a huge range of yogurt from gogurt with sprinkles to plain yogurt. Um, so as best you can try to introduce something that's nutritionally dense. <laughs> um, so Icelandic yogurt in particular is so super strained that it's very high in protein. So that's a wonderful snack. Um, they have low milk fat ones for the kids who don't need to be gaining weight. They have high milk fat ones for the kids who can use the weight. Um, and if it's too sour or too plain for them, you know, mix a little bit of jam in or mix some fruit or whatnot, make it fun and make it a little bit yummier. Uh, but those are kind of the, the alternatives that I like to recommend. Um, for the kids who have a sweet tooth, um, look for the natural options. So again, we talked about these um, different sweeteners and sugars, um, but read your labels and know actually what you're putting into your child. So when you think you're buying pancake syrup or maple syrup. This says no high fructose corn syrup from the outside. It looks decently healthy and you turn it around and the first ingredient is corn syrup, not high fructose, but they can hide it because it's corn syrup. So that's incredibly annoying to me. So please look at the ingredients and try to get something real. So this is just a plain maple syrup. 
Um, and again, everything in moderation, nothing terrible is going to happen if you take your child to IHOP and they get high fructose corn syrup on their pancakes. But in general, if these are the, the things you put in front of them, that's what they're going to learn to like. And this is a really great um, Instagram blogger. This is, I believe she's a dietitian. Um, so she, I recommend following her for anyone who's on Instagram. She recommends sort of this strategic exposure. So for the kids who are um, told they're not allowed to have candy at all, it makes them want to have candy. <laughs> um, but if you're putting a little piece and you're very strategic about giving them small amounts and making it no big deal, they don't seem to be as obsessed with it. So I really like, um, I really like her Instagram. Read your labels. So we'll go through this quickly. I know I only have a few minutes, but sort of contrasting different jellies and reading your labels. So they make this look very healthy, no artificial colors, whatever. Uh, but if you look in the ingredients, there's corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup. So contrast this with the Welch's natural, right? At least there's real sugar in the ingredients, still sugar first ingredient. But what if I give you this? This is all sweetened with fruit juice, right? The price is comparable and there's no other added sugar other than the sweetened fruit juice. So it just takes two minutes more when you're grocery shopping, just to look and see um, sort of the ingredients what you're dealing with. The same thing goes for peanut butter. And I'm obsessed with this because it's so sneaky in the market what they do. So both of these say natural peanut butter. But if you look at the ingredients, this one on the left, Skippy, has sugar and oil added. Peanut butter should just be peanuts and maybe salt, right? So if you read the ingredients of the Smuckers on the right, theirs are just peanuts and salt. So please look and see if you're giving your kids hidden added sugars. Um, healthy meals for kids, um, kind of breakfast choices. So cereals, um, cereal can be great. Cereal can be um, a bowl of sugar. So, you know, once in a while, that's fine, but look for things that are less than five grams of sugar. These are just some uh, options that I like to show you. Um, have, you know, eggs, yogurt parfaits, fruit, um, oatmeal, sort of just healthy options. If you would like to reach out to me after for um, menu choices, I'm happy to talk about this in detail. I know we're running out of time, um, but in general, limit your processed meats and your high sugar items at breakfast. The snacks, um, I'm sorry, the lunches, um, they don't always have to be sort of the picture of of lunches. It doesn't need to be a sandwich and a side. You can sort of switch it up with a protein and fruits and vegetables, leftovers, school lunch, whatever it is. Just talk to your kids about what they're interested in, put in some healthy choices, and I think they'll surprise you. And then these are just, um, you know, some healthy snack ideas, looking for granola bars that are less than ideally six grams of sugar, but more so 10 grams or less. And I know that's hard to do. So these are some brands that I found. And again, everything in moderation. Um, this is another blog that I love. So this is either a feeding therapist or a nutritionist, I can't recall, but she says, even when you serve these foods regularly, it's normal for your child to prefer the snacky carby foods, right? And the cheese, because if you take a bite of a blueberry one day, you may get a nice big juicy sweet blueberry. And then the next day your toddler gets a little sour blueberry. So they can't trust those foods, but when you give them puffs and bread and cheese, they know exactly what to expect. So it's normal for them to gravitate to these things and we can't always change that. Um, so when do you need to see a pediatric gastroenterologist? Um, for any child who is having any prolonged intestinal or GI symptoms, um, chronic pain, diarrhea, constipation, reflux, um, if you or your pediatrician have growth concerns or weight concerns, if your child is unusually picky to the point of um, affecting them socially, if they're having um, fecal soiling, um, feeding issues, if they have abnormal GI labs, um, these are all sort of the common reasons that I see kids. Um, and what we do is obviously examine your child, review the growth charts. We can do imaging, blood work, stool testing. Um, I do upper and lower endoscopy and colonoscopy. Um, there's various medication options for certain conditions and I do extensive nutrition counseling. 
Um, so I'm right at the 745 mark. So I will just leave you with my name and information and I would love to answer any questions that you might have. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, throw some questions out. I follow all of those Instagram accounts. They're both um, registered dietitians and they're amazing. And those Trader Joe's snack bars, the ABCs that you post a picture of, we just bought those for my daughter. And I literally had to hide the box people. So invest in those because they're so good and filling and they're great. Okay, so we have a question that came in. Um, for six to eight, eight months, are food brands like Yumi safe alternatives to the baby food on the shelves like Gerber? Based on the report from Fed, it sounded like some of them, some of the ones on shelves brand were not safe. Are food brands like Yummy safe alternatives? Um, that's a good question. So when that report came out, I became very skeptical of the FDA's regulations. <laughs> um, I'm sure that all of your children are more than fine on these jarred baby foods. I'm sure I had these foods myself as an infant and I think everything turned out fine, but the yummy in particular, they do market that they somehow are free of those potential toxins and chemicals. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think that they were studied the way the other ones were and included in the report. So I don't know. Obviously, if you're very concerned, I would say, you know, you can try to just make the foods by yourself. Um, but I, I haven't heard about yummy in particular being studied either way. Great. So you did mention um, Miralax in the beginning of this. So curious, should people be giving Miralax to their kids without it being recommended if they feel like their kid could use it for constipation? I, I love Miralax, but I wouldn't just do it on your own whim. Um, it, you know, it says on the bottle to use ages, whatever and above. I mean, I use it in obviously much smaller children and babies. Um, and the dose, I would say on the jar is completely irrelevant. Um, and it all depends on how constipated your child is, how old they are, what their diet is like. So I don't usually say just, you know, good luck, figure it out, take it when you need it, because you do need some counseling on exactly how to take it. Um, you know, it works best when you take it all at once. It works best every single day as opposed to every other day. Um, so I would say, you know, you can always ask your pediatrician um, or that would be something I would ask a specialist. Great. Okay, I have one more question, um, unless more come in. What is your opinion on probiotics for a child that already has a healthy, um, gut. That's so funny because I had a probiotic um, slide, but I deleted it because I didn't have time. So for completely normal, healthy kids, I don't think it's necessary. Um, so the studies show that for children who um, have recently taken antibiotics, um, certain strains of probiotics may be helpful in preventing um, diarrhea related to the probiotics. Um, and in certain infectious diarrhea, um, probiotics may be helpful in shortening um, the duration um, of diarrhea. And sometimes in irritable bowel syndrome, in IBS, um, we do recommend it. But for the normal healthy kid, it, I, I, they're expensive. The studies really aren't there. And if you're doing well, you shouldn't really need it. A lot of people think that they um, help with constipation. They don't unless they have like added fiber. So I, I would say outside of those um, specific conditions, I don't typically recommend them. Great. Um, so we did get one more question. With infants that are starting solids, is it normal to see different types of solids? Sometimes a little more runny and sometimes a little more solid. Stools, I'm assuming. Yep, gotcha. <laughs> Wait, I can't see the question. Can you say it again? So with if it, infants that are starting solids, is yeah. it normal to see a different type of stool or different types of poops, like more <laughs> runny, more solid as they're getting used to those new foods? A hundred percent. And it, it might not be even from the food that they're eating. I mean, they could have, you know, gotten a cold or, you know, some other virus or whatnot, but the, the food you 
eat and what you put in your body, a thousand percent changes the texture of your poop, whether you're adult or baby. So um, yes, definitely. If you're giving them prunes and pears and things that make your poops nice and mushy, yes, you're going to see changes and that's, that can be normal. Great. All right. Any other questions? I'll read a quick, quick closing out. Um, and then we can do that. This was super informative. Um, I know myself,